Uh, welcome to all our guests, especially in American corners, Europe-wide and worldwide. And uh, in the interest of making this intense as it should be, I'll stop right here. You all know about Professor Gerchenfeld. In Italy, we like to remember he's been named among the 40 modern Leonardos, probably because Leonardo is from Italy. <laughs> and um, this was by the U.S. Museum of Science and Industry. So today, we'll hear Professor Gerschenfeld talk about Fab Labs and the fabrication movement. So I'll stop right here. He's going to speak about 15 minutes, and then we'll get questions from the audience. Thank you. Thank you. I'm delighted to join you. So I'm going to talk about Fab Labs and their impact and the opportunity, perhaps, for you to participate in this real revolution. And to do that, I want to step back a little bit and talk about the meaning of digital fabrication, those words, and their impact. So digital communication is what's letting me talk to you now. And to go back in history, telephones were analog. Signals got worse with distance. Uh, in the 40s, Claude Shannon wrote the best master's thesis ever. He was at MIT, then went to the phone company. And he invented the digitization of communication. He showed if you communicate in symbols, you can detect and correct errors. And that means you can communicate perfectly. And that may sound technical, but that's when we went from a phone call that got worse with distance to the internet. So you understand the impact of that now. We couldn't do this with an analog phone call. We now have an internet that lets me speak to you around the world. That's the first digital revolution. The second digital revolution is in computing. Uh, MIT used to have an analog computer that's a room full of gears and pulleys. Vannevar Bush made this. And as you ran it, the answer got worse with time. It was analog. Then came digital computing. John von Neumann pioneered that. MIT then developed the TX transistorized computers that became DEC PDPs. Those were the first computers that were used to invent the internet, word processing, video games, all of that. Now digital computing lets you, from wherever you are, get access to things like MIT's classes online, all the world's knowledge. So that's the second one, digital computing. But now there's a third revolution happening, and that's in digital fabrication. So think of this as completing the digital revolution. The first lets you communicate. The second lets you manipulate information. This third digital revolution lets you turn data into things and things into data. It brings the programmability of the digital world out to the physical world. So to understand that revolution, in 1952, MIT made the first computer-controlled manufacturing machine. It took an early air defense computer from Project Whirlwind, connected it to a milling machine, and it was used to control the machine to make aircraft parts for the Air Force. Um, that digitized the design. The machine was analog, though. Y it was just a milling machine. Projecting forward, there are now maybe 20 different computer-controlled processes. You can cut with lasers. You can use jets of water. You can use wires to burn. You can fuse. You can mold. More recently, there are additive processes, 3D printing, where you deposit or fuse or bind. Now, 3D printing has gotten a lot of attention, but it's only actually a small part of the revolution. Um, in a well-equipped lab today, um, if you have all of these computerized machines, the 3D printer is useful, but maybe you use it 20% of the time. It's good for some things, but not everything. Think of it as when microwave ovens were invented, uh, and they were described as the kitchen of the future. You use a microwave, but you use many other things to cook. So it's one of many machines. That's where we are today. What's happening now is a series of stages. First is computers controlling machines. We're now starting to have machines that make machines, machines that can make their own parts. Then from there, we're starting to develop machines that instead of cutting or printing, actually assemble materials that are discrete. 
uh, think of a child playing with Lego bricks. The Lego bricks, you don't need a ruler because the bricks actually have their position. And the Lego bricks correct errors, so they're, when you, the child places them, the structure is more accurate than the child. And you can disassemble as well as assemble them. You don't throw them out. Those are digital properties. And that's actually how our bodies work. Our bodies are built with molecular Lego called amino acids. And so research is developing from molecules to circuits up to airplanes, how to build with materials that are fundamentally digital. And then finally, we're starting to learn how to make programmable materials. So in fact, there isn't even a machine and the materials themselves can change shape. And those stages I just sketch lead up to, in Star Trek, there was the replicator, the machine that would make anything you want. That's where this research is heading. It's not just a 3D printer that makes a piece of plastic. It's actually a cell phone, a car, anything. We actually assemble it from the molecular components on up. So that's, that's the research on digitizing fabrication. Now, the reason I'm talking you to, to you today is let's look at the historical parallels. There are mainframe computers. Those were owned by big organizations. Then came mini computers then hobbyist computers, then PCs. So now if we line that up to this new revolution, uh, the mini computer era was when it went from a million to $100,000 and filled a room rather than a warehouse. And that was the moment in time when everything you do today on a computer happened. Then came the hobbyist computers that were small, not very capable, but inspired a generation of pioneers. Then came the PC. Now, again, a 3D printer isn't yet the analog to the PC because what the PC did was it took all the parts of the mini computer and put them in one box. So in the PC was the processor and storage and graphics and interface and communication and power, all those subsystems integrated in a complete functional system. So the analog to that, the personal fabricator, will take all the different processes, circuits, programming, 2D, 3D, all of that, put it in one box. That's still a research project. But the lesson is you didn't have to wait for the PC to invent the internet and have all the benefits of computing. That happened 20 years earlier with the mini computers. So in the same sense today, the big machines in a lab like mine are like mainframes. The fab labs we'll talk about are like the mini computer. The hobbyist machines we're building today with the machines are like the hobbyist computers, and the research is leading to this personal fabricator. But the lesson from that history is this is not a revolution for the future. It's happening today. From that moment when mini computers were developed, the internet doubled. There was one site, then two, then four, then eight. At some point, it seemed like it just appeared, but it had been doubling for many, many years. And that's what's happening today. The Fab Labs, um, we set up one of them, initially just as outreach, and then they went viral. There's a few hundred now, and they're doubling about every year and a half. So in one of these community labs, there's about, it's about a $100,000 investment in computer-controlled laser, large format mill, uh, 3D printing, 3D scanning, molding, casting, precision machining, circuits, embedded programming, uh, design tools, all that stuff. And with it, you can make just about anything. Um, uh, Fab Lab in uh, Spain, in Barcelona, made a complete solar house as a very ambitious project. One in Afghanistan, in Jalalabad, was used to make a citywide uh, internet. A fab lab in Amsterdam made a very locally appropriate project, a uh, instrumented custom foosball table. So many of the technology products around you, you can make with these tools. Um, as they've spread, um, we've seen uh, a number of implications from access to it. So again, this started just as outreach for the National Science Foundation instead of telling people about the technology, giving them access to it. And to understand it, you can think about it in cost in powers of 10. A lab like mine at MIT has about $10 million in machines. Within it, there's a workshop 
that has about a million dollars in machines that each cost $100,000. One of these community labs has roughly $10,000 $10, machines. One is a 3D printer, but all these other capabilities. And then with those, you can create individual machines for about $1,000 each, like, like one 3D printer or one cutting machine. So this is about the cost and complexity of, say, a town library um, at the scale. And as they've spread, we found the labs are used for many different purposes. They're used to uh, incubate businesses. They're used to play, to make art, to have fun. They're used for outreach. They're used to create um, infrastructure. They're used for education. It really sort of turns on its side all the functions of aid, education, industry. So some of the larger implications coming out of the network, for example, there's a wonderful fab lab in Detroit, and it's been called Insight Focus. It's been working with at-risk youth, kids in juvenile justice, teenage pregnancy. And what that lab has been doing is it brings them into the lab, teaches them all of these skills, and then shows much better life outcomes and engagement in society, interest in science and technology, and learning through this hands-on experience and, uh, compared to the original social services that were on offer there. Um, there's a, a fab lab in Barcelona in Spain and the team that created that lab now actually is running the city. The city architect is Vicente Gallart who started it and, and his friend um, is the deputy mayor and their friend's the mayor and the connection there is 50% youth unemployment uh, but a wonderful design culture um, but an economy that's broken and still buying products made far away. So they're filling the city with fab labs as civic infrastructure. So Barcelona can be globally connected for knowledge, but self-sufficient local for technology. Uh, they in turn did a very interesting project. Spain does aid in Peru, and they arranged for some bright kids from Peru to come to Barcelona, get trained to use the fab lab, and then gave them a fab lab to go back to Peru with. And the ki these bright kids, one of their frustrations was the university was kind of strangling them. And so when they came back with the lab, started to make all kinds of rules and limits. But these empowered kids said, either you, the university, behaves or we'll take our lab outside. And so in fact, the university now responded and the kids are running a wonderful lab there. Oh, there's a lab in... Um, uh, Derry and in Belfast, right at the Protestant Catholic border, where this was done with post troubles reconstruction funding. Um, the maker culture that's attracted to these labs is not split by sectarian boundaries. And so there the labs are bridging across religious divides by the shared interest in making things. I just came back from setting up a lab in Anchorage with the Cook Inlet Tribal Council tremendous native Alaskan culture, but horrible problems with uh, unemployment, alcoholism, suicide. And um, there the lab is being used to empower traditional crafts with these modern tools of fabrication. Um, one of the things we find really driving this is there's a lot of interest in STEM education and knowledge economy around the world, but what's often missed is um, the bright, inventive people who are the focal, focus of this um, don't behave well. They're odd. <laughs> inventive people question assumptions, and so they're often kind of marginalized in their society all around the world. A place like MIT can only fit a small fraction of them. These labs act as magnets for these most inventive people and empower them. And so in turn, what we've since had to do is uh, rather than bright kids being attracted to the labs and then having to leave and go far away, uh, the labs are globally connected by video and content sharing, but they have these technical capabilities. So we're now running distributed education programs where students have peers with mentors and work groups in the labs, um, but then they're globally connected for knowledge. So rather than an online class, that's sort of like in the old days time sharing. There's a knowledge mainframe far away building these fundamentally distributed educational networks. So bright kids 
and really kids of all ages, can be empowered to learn global skills, but, but connected locally. Uh, so it, the technology we thought was hard, that's progressing well. What's been hard is conventionally aid is one function. You give aid to help. Uh, business is a different function. You do that to make money. Education is a different function. You do that to learn. Play is a different function. You do that as something you enjoy. This really turns it on, a, on its side. If in a small space anybody can make anything, all those different functions can happen in the very same place at the very same time. And we found you really need to invent new organizations for that. And so finally, to loop this back to the State Department, we've had very interesting discussions. Domestically, uh, uh, we ran a meeting with White House Office of Science and Technology Policy on the science behind this recently. And Representative Bill Foster, a physicist from Fermilab, just submitted legislation to take uh, the Fab Lab network in the U.S. and charter it as a kind of a national laboratory made out of local labs. Instead of a national lab being a remote billion dollar facility, it's in your community for all the purposes of empowerment, job incubation, infrastructure, all of that. Any one of these labs isn't a critical mass. It doesn't have all of these skills, but the network does. And so Bill's uh, bill, which is right now in committee, would take the, the national network of community labs and really endorse it, charter it as a national program. And there's interest in state, in USAID, in exploring the same function internationally. So doing um, incubation, aid, outreach, education, all those functions uh, by empowering with these tools for digital fabrication. So summing up, think of this as completing the digital revolution. You can communicate it at a distance. You can access knowledge. The fab labs let you, for education, in effect, download the campus. Once you have these tools, you can make whatever else you need to do whatever projects you're doing. Um, for business, what they mean is you can go to market by shipping data. You can invent something in any one of these and send it globally and produce it everywhere. Each of those functions happens at this boundary between information and things. So come back to the libraries that, that lead to the program we're doing today. Libraries um, spread literacy. They empowered through access to information uh, in a range of media. The tools now let you cross this boundary where data can become things and things bec can, can become data. So you can also think about this as libraries that kind of teleport between physical reality and the virtual world of information. So that's where we are today. It cuts across all of these application areas. And there's a wonderful opportunity to explore linking this into the interests in state all around the world um, through the tools of digital fabrication. So with that introduction, I'll be delighted to take any questions. Thank you. Excellent. We could be here for four hours. Unfortunately, we won't be able because we have a, a very tough schedule today. So first thing I want to tell you is that yesterday, in, as part of our spring event annual meeting, we had the chance to listen to Professor Gershers for about 45 minutes and PowerPoint. Now, we're going to make that available. It was streamed live yesterday, but we're going to make that available soon, including the PowerPoint. So that's going to be another opportunity to hear what he had to say. And uh, the second thing is that as the first question, I'll, we only have 10 minutes or so. We have a tough one, exactly from my good friend in Cyprus, and he's asking basically what is what you think is the context for the copyright in the digital world mm -hmm. and specifically 3D printing? Where is it you think we're heading? OK. So let me answer that in two pieces. First of all, uh, uh, allow me a brief diatribe. There's a strange over-focus on 3D printing. I want to yell about that just briefly. In a fab lab, the 3D printer is the fifth most used machine. The most used machine by far is the computer-controlled laser cutter. The laser cutter lets you quickly cut out parts and assemble 3D structures from 2D parts in strong materials that are large. By far the most popular machine. Um, the second most popular machine 
is a large format mill that lets you make boats, bicycles, composite tooling, you know, life-size things. Um, the third most popular machine is a precision mill. Um, that lets you make things like circuit boards and tooling for casting parts. Casting can make stronger parts with better surface finish at lower cost. You know, the fourth most popular machine is a vinyl cutter. It's a computer-controlled knife that lets you do things like uh, screen printing, flexible circuits, stuff like that. Um, then you come to the 3D printer. The 3D printer, the materials are relatively expensive. The process is slow. The material properties are so-so. We use it when you need to make a complex geometry that you can't make with these other machines. But all the other machines, the materials are cheaper, the properties are better, all of that. So. Um, view the 3D printer in this larger context. Uh, the, the better term is digital fabrication. Again, think of a well-equipped kitchen and the role of the microwave oven. The microwave oven has an important part, place in the kitchen, but no more than that. So today's discussion is digital fabrication, not just 3D printing. And in fact, if I could expand on my expanding, um, the focus on 3D printing a gun is, is another aberration <laughs> in that for a long time it's been easy to make guns with these tools. Uh, uh, focusing on just the ability to 3D print it is part of this uh, strange bias in the media about 3D printing. The people who actually use the tools understand it's one of many tools in the portfolio. So with that note, let me zoom out to talk about copyright and digital fabrication. Here, there's a very precise analogy Software was written, used to be written by companies like Microsoft or IBM. Then came Linux and the idea of it's free, nobody pays for anything. Um, what set, and then software companies tried copy protection, trying to use copy protection on software. That failed. It annoyed responsible people and was easily circumvented by irresponsible people. What settled now is think about um, app stores and open source software. You don't try to control the software as a protected thing, but you make money by how you add value with it. So there's still Microsoft and IBM, but now there's a whole ecology of software markets, of app stores for one, ten, a hundred, a thousand, a million, where you don't control access to the software as a scarce resource. You make it easy to buy and sell, easy to, to share, and you add value with how you develop and use it. Look at music. Music was done, owned by the labels. Napster came along. Yippee, it's free, you don't pay anybody. Um, the labels tried um, digital rights management. And that was a disaster. It annoyed responsible people, was easily circumvented by irresponsible people. Finally, the labels gave up on DRM and instead made it easy to buy and sell music. And now, there's still the labels, but arguably that's the least interesting music. Um, through the app stores, we now have this whole ecology of music for one, ten, a hundred, a thousand, a million, this ferment of interesting music creation, and sales of digital music are now finally coming back up again. So in the first case, a string of data becomes a program. In the second case, a string of data becomes music. Now a string of data becomes a thing. And the lesson is you can't protect it as a scarce resource. Anybody with these tools can make it, and you can't control it. But it doesn't mean you don't make money. It means you share the content freely, and you make money by making it easy to buy, sell, customize, um, build services, all of that. So just mentally play through the script of how software and music evolved, and that's exactly what's happening with things. Intellectual property isn't useful here in the traditional sense because there's no barrier to infringement. Anybody with the tools can infringe. So you can't control it as a scarce resource, but it doesn't mean you can't make money, but, it, but it's um, by freely sharing it and building value on top of that. Excellent. We have a few minutes. I, I really like the strange bias you mentioned about 3D printing because we see it all over. You know, probably we need symbols. It's 3D printer may be more attractive to our imagination than a laser cutter, I guess. There's something I was wondering, which is, when you were describing this analogy of the revolution, you basically stopped at the bottom with a PC, right? And I have a six-year-old, and he hardly sees a PC. He sees sometimes a laptop, mm -hmm. and he masters 
mm -hmm. tablet and smartphones. Uh, so what I'm saying is the mobile component mm -hmm. that moved behind the PC, mm -hmm. does it have something in the other column oh, oh in your... Sure, it does, but let me explain why I skipped it. So I if we take the device in my pocket, at one time this would be called a supercomputer. Um, the reason I skipped it is in here are all the functions of the PC. It's just they've been shrunk and packaged more tightly. Mm -hmm. But conceptually, this isn't different from the PC. It's just better integrated. So yeah. in the same sense, um, uh, two of my students made a wonderful thing called the Pop Fab, which is a whole fab lab in a briefcase. So it's a briefcase. You open the briefcase, pop it up, and it's a machine. It's interchangeable. You can use it as a 3D printer or a cutting tool or a milling tool. And so that's an example of a briefcase fabrication lab. They're already starting to make mobile ones. And as we move towards the assemblers I described, those necessarily are going to be smaller, scaled by the parts they're assembling. And so w we're busy working on portable versions of these machines. In my history, the reason I didn't really distinguish that is technically it, it's just better it's integrated. PC. It's not qualitatively different. And that goes to the next element, which is when you probably bought your first, uh, not smartphone, but phone, that costed like 2,000 bucks, right? And then it, now mm -hmm. they're giving it to you for free. Right. Uh, so when we hear all of these investments where it appears, you know, you're at MIT, are the big rich mm -hmm. guys, and then the mm -hmm. poor guys make it with, what's driving the costs of this? Equipment. If you see. Will we see a trend in these things going oh, down? Oh, absolutely. But there's an early implication to that. So I said a fab lab is $100,000. A common reaction is, ooh, I can buy a 3D printer for a few thousand dollars. Um, to relate these, a fab lab today has all of the tools you need, not just to make something, but to make a fab lab, meaning it's the machines that have enough capabilities that you can make a complete machine with those. Now, um, with the tools in a fab lab today, you can make all the machines I described, and each of them has a few hundred dollars in parts, and maybe it's $1,000 integrated. Um, so the cost is coming down very, very quickly. The, I'd say the limitation for that right now is you could go into a lab today and make one of these for a few hundred dollars. There isn't yet, and it's just starting to come, supply chains where if you don't want to make one of these, where do you get one of these do-it-yourself machines? Um, so how do you source them? A, a few of my former students have had very successful Kickstarter projects. Max Lebowski with the Form 1 printer and Jonathan Ward and colleagues. Um, with the other cutter, where they're starting to take these do-it-yourself style machines, but make them available at scale. So the cost is coming down very quickly to thousands and hundreds of dollars for the machines. But the reason why we've, well, I, I should say, we didn't have an agenda to spread Fab Labs. This, they're, they're getting pulled. But the reason we're not worrying too much about these $100,000 labs is the cost is coming down very, very quickly. That's going to happen, but, but we don't need to wait for that to get done. The, the, the impact is today. But yeah, the machines that make machines are dropping quickly. And that relates to the last question we're going to get because we got several dozen people waiting outside. Uh, we have a question that says, how do we keep Fab Labs a truly grassroots endeavor? Are you concerned that they will become fee-based and run by marketplace like the internet has it in some cases? Yeah, that's a lovely question. The power of this fab lab movement has been th the labs are magnets for inventive people. You don't try to segregate money, play, learning, sort of all, all those. And they've really flourished in these kind of informal institutions. So it's a wonderful question. I, uh, what we do see is there are four fee controlled places that have these facilities, but they don't have the same kind of culture I'm describing. If you, if you erect barriers, you kind of strangle the innovation and they don't flourish. Um, I think the real implication for that question is when we first started setting them up, we didn't have enough money to run them. So we just did, out of necessity, we found community stakeholders. We would give them the tools and teach them, but they would have to run it integrated in their community. And I think that's a really good model for thinking about how a formal institution like state works for these informal institutions. It's really important these are live with, owned, run by community stakeholders with community engagement, but empowered in this global way. The, 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 the social engineering is, if anything, more important than the technical engineering to make it work. 
Well, thank you. Uh, we managed to do Alpha Hour, and uh, we thank you all for tuning in. I know it's been too short, as we would like to have at least an hour, as we do other times. But take it as a trailer. You know, we you can get soon. In a couple of days, we'll put the 45 and more minutes we had yesterday with Professor Gershenfeld, and I wish to thank him. I know he has an extremely busy day today in Rome. Thanks, and uh, stay tuned on Connects, uh, this program of the U.S. Department, State Department for you. And if I could just close by saying, if you, ex if you like this, join it. Uh, nobody is in charge. This is spread virally. We encourage you to participate. Thank you. Thank you so much.